Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. I'm Sally Warhaft, and uh, tonight it's a particular pleasure uh, to have our two guests here to try and um, talk about a topic that really seems to me to have fallen off the radar. And one of the things we try and do in this series is to bring it back. Uh, and so joining me tonight to talk about gambling is uh, Nick Xenophon, who of course will be known to you all. He's an independent senator in every way, I think we can say. And uh, he was previously, of course, in the South Australian Parliament before going federal. He's focused on all sorts of issues, including asbestos, victims of crime, food labelling, the water crisis. But he's best known, of course, for his uh, views about pokies and gambling. And also on the stage is Michaela Maguire. She's author, blogger and curator of the best-selling and super cool Women of Letters Salon. If you haven't been to one, you must uh, check it out. It's an absolutely brilliant way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Her latest book, though, is called Last Bets, a true story of gambling, morality and the law. And it follows the manslaughter case that I think will be familiar to um, most Melburnians that came uh, against the security guards at Crown Casino uh, after the death of a patron there in 2011. Anthony Dunning was his name. And Michaela's written this um, really interesting book about uh, going to the court case, the committal, and then the, the actual court case. But uh, interweaving that with the questions of, of ethics and morality of gambling and the law. Please welcome our guests tonight. So um, we're going to talk about politics and policy and so on, but I want to start by talking about the culture of gambling and to find out from both of you what you actually think of gambling in Australia when I just put it to you that broadly. Michaela, you worked in a casino for a while. I did. Your um, hell days, it sounded <laughs> like, from your description. Um, yes, my opinion of gambling was for, formed quite early on when I was 21 years old and working in a high rollers room as a waitress in Brisbane's casino for about six months, which was about as long as I could handle that particular job for. Um, it seemed very glamorous at the time. I was quite young and was you know, ready to be sort of dazzled by the high life and even just staying up till four in the morning at that time seemed, you know, on the face of it, quite glamorous. Like, it's like watching what the grown-ups do after the kids go to bed. Um, but the grown-ups were getting up to fairly depressing um, behaviour for the most part. It was more track pants than tuxedos in those high roller rooms. Um, uh, but the whole thing was just desperately sad. And the only people that I could see at the casino at five in the morning didn't seem to be enjoying it particularly much. Um, they were often alone. Um, they often sat at poker machines for hours and hours. And the poker machines that were in the rooms that I was working in were all set at a minimum of fifty dollars a spin. So it wasn't a casual flick of a button. It, you know, would have meant quite a lot of money, uh, which obviously these people had to some extent. Um, but the thing that really stuck with me of that particular experience was one. My main job was to clean out ashtrays. That was the best part of being a waitress there. Um, there are all sorts of interesting laws that allow smoking in certain areas of casinos if they're exclusive enough. So my job was to make sure that there was no ashtray that had a cigarette butt in it, otherwise my supervisors would lose their mind and I'd probably lose my job. So I'd have to bend down very close to people to get these um, cigarette containers in, out of in between the pokey machines. And one night I was bending down quite low, as you had to do, and I noticed a distinct smell of urine. Uh, coming from a man who was sitting at the pokey machine. So I sort of went away kind of subtly and called my supervisors and asked what I should do. Um, and they said that I'll have to approach him and ask him uh, to perhaps go and clean himself up, which I did. Um, and he's like, oh, no, I'm not leaving this machine. It's going to pay out really soon. And I was like, what? And he's like, I'm not incontinent. I did it on purpose. <laughs> I was like, um, so that was my first impression of the culture of gambling. Nick, it's not all it's not all casinos, of course, is it? 
No, and, and I guess I, I came to the gambling debate relatively late in the sense I was minding my, my own business in a suburban legal practice. So, you know, a lawyer turned politician, two of the most hated occupations in the country. Uh, <laughs> although I did do talkback radio for there a while, go, so it makes yeah. it a trifecta. Yeah. <laughs> um, and suburban legal practice specialising in personal injuries in a suburb called Paradise, of all places. And after the introduction of poker machines in South Australia, a couple of years after Victoria, uh, in pubs and clubs back in... 25th of July 1994, so 20th anniversary is coming up very soon. And I began to see clients with problems, um, directly or indirectly, saying that their kids uh, uh, or their parents or grandparents were having gambling problems because of poker machines. And the tipping point for me was one particular client who had a brain injury um, uh, due to an industrial accident. He also had a very severe alcohol problem and he broke down in my office one day because we'd arranged for him or another lawyer arranged for him to get an emergency superannuation power to cash out his super because we were waiting for his case to settle. And he'd blown almost all of the $30,000, this is nearly 20 years ago, on the pokies. And what hurt him the most, or upset him the most, was that while he was losing his money, the two pokies venues, one in particular, would pick him and his mum, he was in his 40s, living with his mum, he was quite marginalised, and they would give him free drinks, free meals. He would be so drunk that the staff would have to push the buttons for him to keep playing. And I know one dodgy, one or two dodgy pubs don't make a dodgy industry, but it got me thinking about the level of exploitation, how they could use somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And that's when I contacted Tim Costello, who was campaigning, and I thought this is wrong and that's when I decided to run for state parliament in the 1997 election. And I was elected on preferences but there was no preference whisper involved. Everybody felt sorry for me on both sides of politics. <laughs> they thought this idiot's running on, a, this village idiot is running on this anti pokies platform. But there was enough of a community groundswell. It resonated with people to the extent that I got in. Well, enough to that you've been re-elected without that need for preferences and taken a buddy along with you. I mean, it's, uh, mm. it's, uh, that's, that's all... Uh, changed. What is it about pokies? Uh, because, I mean, there are obviously so many forms of even gambling, in, you know, there's horse racing, there's sports betting, there's casinos, there's pokies, there's cards, then there's the stock market, there's uh, things that we might not think of as even, mm. uh, you know, gambling in a broader sense. But pokies cause a lot of heartache. And there's something, uh, there's some things about pokies that are a little bit unique. Tell us why pokies are so damaging. Uh, well, I, I guess I remember one psychiatrist telling me that they're the most seductive and addictive form of gambling because mm. they're accessible. Um, and online gambling is now another frontier, but they're accessible. You can, uh, there's the lights, there's the sounds, there's a the reinforcement. Uh, f uh, aristocrat. Uh, the poker machine makers talking about selling coals to Newcastle. Uh, it's a case of they um, they sell machines into Las Vegas. Uh, I think one year their R and D budget was about 130 million dollars. So that's quite telling. And it's that almost mesmeric effect of, of of the machines, that random reinforcement. And the father of modern psychology, behavioural psychology, B. F. Skinner, um, he talked about poker machines being the perfect operant. Um, a conditioning machine, uh, you know, where, in, where rats were, were were given rewards, random rewards, mm. a and I guess the other issue why they've taken off is that they made pubs, in particular, a safe place for women to go to alone, and the problem gambling rate in Victoria and other parts of the country, apart from New South Wales, which has had pokies for years, was about three percent of problem gamblers were women, and now it's closer to fifty fifty because of the feminisation of gambling with poker machines. Hmm. You, you write about that hypnotic, what's it called, the machine, the machine zone? The machine zone. Yeah, um, I agree. It's the psychology that's behind poker machines and it's incredibly well researched um, that makes it so dangerous and it's dangerous by design. Um, there's this anthropologist in the States who spent quite a few years interviewing pokey addicts uh, in Las Vegas called Natasha Schull who wrote a book called Addiction by Design. 
and she spoke to a lot of um, game designers who make the pokey machines and talks about like tweaking the algorithms behind each one to be quite specific. Um, and she concluded that some people like to be bled slowly. Um, some people don't want to sit there for just half an hour and lose their money quickly and then walk away. Some people actually prefer to sit there for five or six hours and will quite contentedly do so. Um, but I spoke about this with David Walsh, the um, notorious gambler who runs Mona down in Tasmania. Uh, and he says that the thing that makes pokies in particular so insidious and so dangerous is that it's the only form of gambling where you control the frequency. Um, with horse racing, you have to wait for the horses to jump out of the barriers. With a sports game, you have to wait until you know the 60 or 90 minutes elapses. But with pokies, you can sit there and you can press that button as often or as quickly as you like. And that's he, he also told you that he's, he's a, f a fan of Las Vegas, this idea yeah. that it was a purpose-built, sort Carnival. of secluded kind of place that most people just went to for four days a year mm. and that the spectacle of it actually removed it uh, from Everyday the behavior. kind of culture of gambling that I, I, um, is more sort of pervasive, or, I, I, I suppose. Did that... Um, you know, strike well. Actually, I mean, what do you think, Nick? If we could just turn Tasmania into a David Walsh casino uh, and forget the art, would that suit? You know, would that work? Look, it, do, it, do, it doesn't. If you're one of the locals, I think Las Vegas has, and I'm sure the ABC fact checking unit is listening. So hello to them. But uh, <laughs> one of the, uh, I've read somewhere that that Las Vegas, for the the permanent residents there, has one of the highest levels of of suicide and domestic violence and crime uh, anywhere in the US because because of that gambling culture is so pervasive it's it sort of almost seeps into your bones uh, if you're a local there because it's, it, the whole city is built on gambling so I think Rupert Murdoch once said if you have gambling stick it in a desert somewhere and so that it's not that pervasive uh, I, I think if you'd have a lower rate of gambling addiction if that was the case it doesn't solve the problem um, it's destination gambling rather than that McDonaldization of gambling where it's on every street corner. And that's that's the difference. But that still doesn't get away from the, the ethical and moral issues involved uh, with gambling. But now, of course, with online gambling, to quote my friend Tim Costello, with online gambling, you can lose your home without ever actually having to leave it. Mm. And that is the big issue. So tell us then about the how that is developing because uh, you know you've got casino culture you've got um clubs and pubs and now of course this new online sort of mammoth uh sort of change in in what people are, are able to do what, what what is the current state of play with that and what might we expect um could happen all right, I'm trying to give you a one-minute tour of mm. the legislation because mm. back in 2001 when Brian Harradine was still alive, I remember lobbying him. It's interesting being lobbyist, an unpaid lobbyist, against, um, against gambling and they're now being lobbied all the time. Um, laws were passed in 2001, the Interactive Gambling Act. Basically, you can do sports betting uh, and there's a big issue... Um, ..in relation to getting of credit betting, which I think needs to be outlawed, so... Um, for any journalists out there, uh, I'm going to have another crack at it when Parliament resumes next week to look at outlawing credit betting uh, on the online, the authorised, the online gambling sites. Uh, and then you have the whole issue where even kids know about the odds in a game. It's so all pervasive, the advertising. You still can't play poker machines and roulette games and poker um, online. That's illegal, but people do play it because you have access to unauthorised sites, many of them in Gibraltar, and believe me, I've tried to, I've acted for a number, represented a number of constituents with problems uh, from losing a lot of money in Gibraltar. Jeez, it's hard to get a response mm. from the regulator there and, and things like that. So that's illegal. There'll be a push to open that up in terms of online poker. Uh, that's the Productivity Commission says you can liberalise that, but not the other stuff. I disagree. Um, but at the moment, we're in this limbo land. Uh, you can still. And the Productivity Commission did suggest it, didn't they? Because it, it, as a as a way of checking it out, the, of, of let's have a look at, at, at this one game online and um, see how. I mean, it's a very regulated industry, gambling, isn't it? 
and and I suppose as a as an attempt to 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 try uh, that with the online, you, you didn't mind that. Is that what you just said? No, no, I have an issue with that. And look, yeah. it is a regulated industry. Um, Charles Livingston uh, co-wrote an essay that the academic from Monash, who, who I think is very well respected, very independent on these issues. It is a very regulated industry, but it's an industry where uh, it's regulated to the extent, in crude terms, a machine won't electrocute you, but it will make you go bankrupt. And that's what the distinction is. It's regulated so that uh, there isn't overt corruption in terms of the mob doesn't control the machines. It's uh, it's not run, you have to have certain probity tests to run machines, but the machines are, um, as Michaela has said, they're, they're dangerous by design. And th they are designed to, the house always wins. So there's something intrinsically wrong about the machine. And I think as politicians fail to take on the industry or walk away from it, mm. then I think the last best hope will be litigation in the courts. And that will be a very messy, and drawn out case, you need the right set of circumstances for that to, to play out. And your book, I mean, it, it, it is about that space too, between what the law can do and and a sense of what what sort of a... The moral response yeah. might be. Um, well, actually, I wanted to ask you, Nick, I mean, how can we get... I mean, for all the information and all the opinions that gambling is morally wrong and that you know, there's quite a lot of persuasive evidence that maybe these people are being manipulated, that it's a horrible thing to allow to happen. Um, but until like 10% of Victoria's state revenue doesn't come from gambling taxes, I mean, how can we look at a legal response to a moral issue? I mean, how can we untangle that? Well, I think you need to look at gambling taxes are fool's gold. When you consider the negative costs involved, the Productivity Commission says it's $4.7 billion, and I think that's in terms of a negative cost to, to the community. Uh, I think pokies are a job killer, not a job creator. There was an interesting study done by the SA Centre for Economic Studies a few years ago. For every dollar lost, for every million dollars rather, lost on poker machines, it creates just over three jobs. Six dollars spent on retail creates about six jobs. Six, um, a million dollars um, spent on in hospitality creates about 18 jobs. So it actually sucks away money from the economy. So I think the Commonwealth has a role to play to say, don't rely on gambling taxes. Uh, we will have incentives so that we'll have disincentives for you to rely so heavily on gambling taxes. Um, they need a carrot and stick approach with the states to wean them off it. And if they do that, uh, state treasurers will become born again gambling reformers quicker than you could say vertical fiscal imbalance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tony Abbott's government um, is Obviously, the philosophy of the Liberal Party is freedom. That you know, if people want to gamble, mm. they've got every right to to do it in whatever that way they want. That that would that's I, I suppose a simple starting sort of liberal philosophy of personal freedom. Um, tell us about um, well, well, we'll start with Tony Abbott's policy. We might work back about how it's managed to change. Uh, so much since, um, well, Andrew Wilkie uh, mm. and uh, mm. Julia Gillard. But if we if we start from the present, what's wrong with Tony Abbott's uh, policy of more individual, where where problem gambling um, is seen as very much an individual issue, not anything to do with community? What what is wrong with this? I can answer it this way. A few months before he died, Don Dunstan, the legendary reforming Labor Premier of South Australia, had a long chat with him about gambling. Uh, this is a man that led the nation on consumer law reform, uh, gay law reform, a whole range of issues. I don't think you could accuse Don Dunstan of being a wowser. And he said to me, people should be free to take their own poison, provided it doesn't hurt anybody else. And that's the whole issue with problem gambling because we know from the Productivity Commission, on average, seven people are directly affected by every problem gambler. It's your family, it's your friends, it's your workmates, it's the people that you've stolen from to feed your addiction. So I don't buy that individual freedom argument um, because it does impact on other people's lives. Interestingly, a couple of years ago, I did a, a media conference when Tony Abbott was opposition leader, uh, pledging to clamp down on online gambling but there's a, almost a, a dichotomy between online gambling that he's concerned about, and I welcome that, and p 
poker machines where he treats clubs as the soul of the community and you can't take away their revenue stream, even though, interestingly, in WA, which doesn't have pokies outside the casino, they've got the highest level of sporting participation anywhere in the country, so they managed to do all right without pokies. What do you think of the, the, the argument of just individual freedom, okay, if people want to blow their money, it's entirely up to them how they do it, where most people safely and ga gamble and enjoy it and it is a recreational activity for most Australians. Yeah, um, it's a complicated issue for me. Um, I spoke to David Walsh, which complicated matters further. He sort of broke my head open with lots of different arguments, um, calling from psychology and religion and philosophy and astrology. And This is a guy that made $16 million on a Melbourne Cup bet, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, that's not where he makes most of his money from. Um, he more engages in statistical arbitrage and there is a distinction um, that's quite boring and long and mathematical. But um, So he set forward the argument to me that how can we say that a behaviour that humans have been engaging in since the beginning of time, thereabouts, can be morally wrong. Um, you can look at other behaviours that humans have been doing since the beginning of time under their own free will, like murder or infanticide, that are probably more clearly morally incorrect. Um, and then there are also other arguments about yeah, the squashing of free will. Like There are studies that can be done to show that certain people or certain groups of people are more genetically disposed to have an addiction, and then whether or not lawmakers say no it's not okay for you to do it but it is okay for this set of people to do it because you are more likely to be able to handle it in a responsible recreational pattern um, so I understand that side of it but then my family is one of those families that's been impacted by problem gambling um, a couple of years ago one of my uncles surprised the whole family by sending an email around that took all of us by complete surprise um, that he had sunk something like $150,000 into centre bed um, and this was without any of us knowing. Um, so for all of the, you know, I support free will and people being able to do what they want, but I've also seen how that can go quite awry and that it's not just the one person who is affected and then the sort of spectacular fallout from that point onwards. So it's quite complicated. Mm. Nick, can you explain to us um, what happened with Andrew Wilkie and Julia Gillard um, at a time when gambling had everyone's attention, wh whatever side you were on or whatever you felt about it, 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 it had everyone's attention and it no longer does. So wh what has happened? Andrew Wilkie at all times acted in good faith. He used his office as a base when he was negotiating with, the Prime, Minister, with Prime Minister Gillard after the 2010 election. It was a knife-edge election he didn't have enough, she didn't have enough votes to get across the line to form a majority. Andrew will keep moved first. It was a first mover advantage, if you like, to try and get the best possible deal. And it's no secret that what Andrew asked for was for $1 bets, as recommended by the Productivity Commission, so maximum $1 a spin, not $50 a spin. Um, maximum loss of $120 now. The way you do that is you reduce the jackpot so the machines are less volatile, less addictive. They opposed that. It was really interesting. They were the, the advisors, the PM's office would not go anywhere near that, and we ended up with this convoluted mandatory pre-commitment formula. Much more difficult, much easier to shoot down, but we thought that was the best we could do, plus a, a select committee that would look at the whole issue of gambling to keep the issue alive. I found out through uh, a contact in the PM's office um, that effectively they were never the allegation was they were never really that serious about about dealing with the issue, um, that it would bury it by having a long uh, drawn out committee process, a drawn out legislative process, and a mandatory pre-commitment model that would be quite easy to argue against, even though it was much more benign that it was portrayed. So we were almost, we were doomed from the start. The issue was kept alive, I think in hindsight, uh, when things were going pear-shaped, uh, we should have argued for uh, a plebiscite, a referendum on pokies. It sounds like a cop-out, but the fact is most MPs in lower house seats are absolutely terrified of the power of the pokies lobby, particularly in New South Wales and in Victoria to a certain extent and in my home state of South Australia. Because a pub with pokies 
it's nothing for them to swing fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in a in a seat. Uh, they could swing an election campaign. A plebiscite would bypass all that, and would create, uh, if passed for Pokey's reform, would create enormous moral suasion on MPs, moral pressure on MPs to say, well, we can't ignore the will of our electorate on this issue. That's what we should have done, and maybe we'll try it again. Mandatory, you've depressed me now. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, um, it's a, you've got a long way to go, I would have thought, before that, that would even be close to being uh, possible in the current, the current climate. Most Australians, though, um, according to the Productivity Commission at any rate, have a problem with the... It wasn't clear whether it was the amount of gambling or the pervasiveness of it or, or but but the, the thought that gambling was not like other forms it's, it's of both. recreation. We're still the number one prob- gamblers in the world per capita. Singapore is just below us, but in terms of gambling losses, about $20 billion a year. Um, most what, of it on do poker you know, machines. Do you have a sense, both of you, of why we, mm. you know, we're such mad gamblers? We're a fairly permissive culture in lots of ways. Um, I mean, it's quite similar to alcohol, isn't it? Um, just the casual manner that Australians talk about it and, you know, playing two up is, you know, it's like our heritage, really. Um, and just that casualness of it is, it carries over so that people who are just spending, you know, upwards maybe $50 a week can be looked at as somewhat of a, not even a habit, like a manageable hobby, I suppose. You know, like I work at a law firm with people who just duck off to the TAB at lunch. Like it's as you know casual as getting a coffee or getting a roll of sushi. Um, people in my family were really into horse racing. Like I remember being able to recite my dad's TAB code over the phone um, when I was six years old because he made that many calls in front of me. Um, but you know, he's only spending five or ten bucks at a time. But I think because there are so many people who do it so casually, it allows that more casual behaviour to perhaps excuse or forces people to somewhat look the other way for those who it is quite a larger problem for. And I think Australians also just, as a culture, don't really like being told what to do very much or don't like being able to be told that they can't do something that they feel that they have a right to do, um, which is where any sort of reform is going to be quite difficult, I think. Uh, can I just say that, that if you look at the statistics of gambling losses, they, they skyrocketed um, from 1992... Uh, uh, over 10 years, there was a period of about 10 years, or five years rather, when they doubled from $5 billion to $10 billion. They doubled because Victoria, Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania all liberalised poker machines. And it was because that, that permissiveness was legislative permissiveness and there weren't people marching in the streets for the right to have poker machines. You had the Victorian and South Australian governments had gone broke because of state bank disasters. It was an easy fix because the states had lost a lot of their taxing powers and it's a lazy way of taxing. You say it's a voluntary tax, but in fact it's a tax where 40% of pokies losses come from problem gamblers. It's a tax, it's, it's a tax on the vulnerable and, and, the, and the poor. And I think that it took off, not because of, it, but it played on that sense of we like having a game of two up on, on Anzac Day and uh, the Melbourne Cup, but our gambling losses weren't that great. It, it, they just took off because we liberalised poker machines and that's, and that's what caused the epidemic to, to take off. The, the pokies too, I mean, we know about that it, it's the biggest problem for problem gamblers. There's something also just incredibly sad about the, the, the pokies addiction, that it's somebody alone generally, mm. people tend to play them on their own. It's not like going to the races with friends or even being in a Tats Lotto syndicate, that, that it's, um, there's something being tapped into and it, it, if you oppose it, uh, exploited uh, there at a very vulnerable level of sort of social disconnectedness. That um, I mean, I, I wonder whether this... Do, do people really think they're going to win I mean, because to, to, to assume that people think they're going to win when night after night or day after day they're going to play a pokey where it's very clear that the odds are against them is to assume that big evil 
casino represented by James Packer against poor, vulnerable, stupid people. And I don't, th- I don't think that dichotomy is quite right. I think it's more, much more complicated mm. than, than that. Just... Well, I mean, addictions aren't rational. Um, I don't think that that sort of level of thinking comes into it particularly often. I mean, we talked a little bit about this before, the machine zone, um, that wonderful sort of lull that you get sucked into when you are sitting in front of a poking machine and um, your psychology has been very finely attuned to react to these like flashing lights and the certain responses that you get from the machine. Um, and I know this because I got addicted to a similar type of game that uses the same sort of psychology called Candy Crush, which is just a stupid game that you play on your mobile phone. And I like to think that I'm a reasonably intelligent person who should know better. Um, But I got completely sucked into this stupid game where you just match up like coloured jewels on your phone. I was playing it for hours at a time and I'd start to feel quite anxious if I wasn't playing it and I'd feel like this sense of relief when I started playing the game again. And then when I used up my available lives, I'd like feel like a you know a set of panic so I think that that sort of feeling is what people think about like the relieving of that discomfort when they sit down at a pokey machine rather than the statistics and rather than looking at the sign that's posted on every poker machine saying don't play the machines you can't beat the machines the house always wins like that information's there if you want to look at it and if you want to take it in but it's meaningless though to yeah. many people mm. Sports uh, betting advertising is probably the the thing that's most on the radar at the moment as a point of discussion into this, and it's one that um, people feel really strongly about. Uh, I do. Any other thing, the idea that uh, kids are... that you have to go to the footy and watch uh, that kind of advertising on a family outing uh, is weird. Where, you know, where should regulation be? How do you, how do you um, sort this out without impinging on, again, the liberty and freedom of people to what sell sports? their wares? <laughs> mm. I think that that's right. I agree, Michaela. The, uh, I think you, the primary freedom is to be able to watch sports without <laughs> being bombarded by Tom Waterhouse or whoever the hell uh, is trying to spruik for it. I put up a bill, the Greens put up a bill um, in relation to banning sports betting. My view is pretty straightforward. If your sports games are watched by hundreds of thousands of kids on national codes, whether it's AFL or NRL or um, soccer, whatever, um, just don't have gambling ads. None of this minimalist thing of where you can have it during halftime but not during live odds. Just don't have them. Um, it's, It's... it, it affects kids. It, when kids, when 10-year-olds, when parents tell me that their 10-year-olds or 8-year-olds are talking about the odds, then you know of a game, then you know that we've gone off the rails. And also being distracted online by misrepresentative things that look like apps or look like, and you know, suddenly mm. you're at a, at a site and, and you're nine and, years and, old. And interestingly, some of the game makers, whether it was Candy Crush, I don't know whether... It'd be interesting to know whether they also uh, make poker machines because some of these game manufacturers or so-called gaming uh, for kids' games are also involved in the development of poker machines. Mm. So what's the vibe uh, in the you know national capital at the moment, Nick, on, on addressing this? There is no vibe at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> There's not even a vibe. It's not even, you know, you can't even talk about Marbo or the Constitution. It's, it's, it's not, there's no vibe. There's just no we, vibe at it, all. There's no vibe at all, but, it, but it's incumbent on me and others to, uh, to create a vibe, to, to actually say this issue isn't going away. I mean, the issue will never go away while people are still being hurt daily, when families are breaking up, when people are stealing uh, from their employers or, or committing uh, armed robberies to feed their gambling addiction, when people are taking their lives because of gambling, of gambling addiction. The worst thing that I've ever had to do is to sit with families who've lost a loved one. And in some cases, you read the note. And it's just awful. I still think of the first suicide note that I read that was shown to me by a man whose wife was, they were married almost 30 years and he lost his life partner, he'd forgiven her for losing the money that she did, he said we'll work through it, it's only money, 
but she couldn't bear it. And I think if there's one thing, we need to destigmatize the guilt that people feel for gambling addiction. The only people that should be feeling guilty are the people that make money off these machines and politicians who sit on their hands and listen to an industry that sucks up to them. Do either of you know anything about uh, how support services for uh, problem or gambling addicts uh, and their success rates or, or lack of sit next to other addictions, so alcoholism or drug addiction, or when when it when the policy is very much on individual responsibility to and and providing services to fix individual problems. Do you know much about whether or not those pathways work, and if they're similar to to other uh, addictions? I actually don't know anything about that. Sadly, I do, because I was part of a parliamentary inquiry into it. 10 to 15% of people with a gambling problem get help. The 85 to 90% don't actually get help. So when the industry says, oh, one problem gambler is one too many, or, um, you wonder whether they mean it, because so few people actually get help. There isn't enough money for every time there's a, a, a TV campaign for... Uh, for problem gamblers, and the Victorian government did a great campaign a number of years ago where the number of people seeking help skyrocketed, which is good. People came out of their shell. People felt destigmatised in a sense. Um, some, some programs are better than others. Cognitive behaviour therapy. Sometimes just sitting down with a relationships counsellor can make all the difference. And other times it's really hard yards to break that cycle of addiction. So different programs work. Uh, more effectively than others, depends on the individual, but the big problem is that 85 to 90% of problem gamblers don't even uh, go to the, make the phone call to get help. And those, you know, those ads, if you, if, you know, in terms of having a gambling problem at casinos and on, on poker machines at Crown and at venues, are really pretty wishy-washy. Mm. Tell us a bit more, Michaela, about your... Um your, what you learned about, in this case, the casino, Crown Casino's sense of its responsibilities. This is a part, I should say, from the man who died, whose case you followed, who didn't have a gambling problem. But, but your <clears throat> research and the time that you spent looking at this about the level of responsibility that is there in the casino... Um, it was quite tricky to unravel this throughout the court case that I sat in on because it was a manslaughter trial um, for a crime, or an alleged crime that just happened to take place in a casino. And it was um, casino employees rather than Crown Casino as a whole uh, that were on trial. But throughout the nine or so weeks that I sat in court, um, I did get a very strong sense of the way that Crown considered its behaviour to be what was what it had to do and what it could do, um, which were quite different things. Um, the thing that interested me in this particular manslaughter case so much was that, um, so Anthony Dunning had been restrained uh, by security staff on a Sunday night just after being out at the football. A bouncer decided that he was drunk. He was asked to leave the premises. Um, there was an altercation with two of his friends and Anthony Dunning was pinned to the floor of the casino for nearly six minutes. Um, by three to six security guards at all times. And so he left the casino unconscious in an ambulance and then died in hospital four days later. Um, but that incident wasn't reported to Victoria Police by anyone at Crown Casino. It was his two friends who'd been there on the night who called them the next day to say what had happened. Um, and later that week, Victoria Police made a statement after Anthony Dunning had died, saying that although Crown didn't have any legal responsibility to have notified them, they probably had a moral responsibility to have done so. And so that was the gap that I set out to explore between the morals and the law. Um, and it did seem a lot of the time that Crown very carefully looked at what law did apply to them, what they were required to do, and where the grey areas were that could perhaps be worked to their advantage. Um, and just the extraordinary amount of money that Crown has at its disposal um, allowed them to make sure that they could get the very best um, outcome that was possible out of the legal system. It costs a lot of money to run a trial like that, with so many barristers involved. Um, 
but there's been a public inquiry uh, that's been called for into Crown Casino that will be a more civil case that looks at its practices and what it is actually, um, what its responsibilities really are, um, which would be fascinating if that does come to pass. They, they employ their own priest, which I found quite surprising. Uh, they do. Yeah. Father Grant, um, yeah. he's got a few opinions about you, Nick. Yes, he didn't, he didn't speak too highly uh, about your... Um... That's okay, I'll forgive him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very good of you. Um, um, <laughs> it's a very special day today, of course, and you know we're extra lucky to have you on the 1st of July. I'm surprised you're not out there doing some special kind of voodoo dance or something, because... Uh, uh, your your Senate family, of course, alters today. Um, can you give us a bit of insight into what what that might mean uh, for for gambling reform, but also more generally too? Well, firstly, I know some commentators have unfairly unkindly said that the new Senate's going to be a bit like that barroom scene from Star Wars. Um, <laughs> If only. If only. only it were that interesting. I bars being mm. I do T do or whoever, um, little robot. Um, Who's going to be Chewbacca? <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm covered for defamation. There's no parliamentary <laughs> privilege here. Um, I, interestingly, the Greens, um, John Madigan from the DLP, Senator from Victoria, uh, Clive Palmer says he's against damage caused by pokies, which I'm very encouraged by. Uh, Family First says they are. David Leinholm, Leinhelm, sorry, uh, the Liberal Democrat, obviously has a philosophical position, that uh, libertarian position, so he won't be with us on that. But I think you'll have the majority of the crossbenchers, a record number of 18, who want to do something about, about gambling, where, how the opportunity will present itself remains to be seen, but I think it just has to be a grassroots community campaign, make it an issue at the next election, uh, whether it means you run uh, ga- anti-gambling candidates or pokies reform candidates in individual seats, because it's one thing that terrifies a politician from either of the major parties, it's the thought of losing their seat on preferences. So, you know, it's a hard game, it's a hard business, but maybe you need to we're actually talking about people's lives being destroyed, people actually losing their lives, so maybe enough is enough. We, we tried to do, play nice uh, with Andrew Wilkie and, his, and, and the pokies reforms, and we were completely dudded. So I think enough people feel strongly about this to, to change their vote, uh, uh, to, to try and swing the outcome. But we, we can't give up. There are too many people who are hurt. Productivity Commission says conservatively, but 120,000 people with a gambling problem uh, severe gambling problem, another 280,000 on the way to developing one. Seven people affected for each problem gambler. So, it's, you know, conservatively, there's a well, couple of million people affected. Yeah, and it, I mean, you can say 120 or 150,000 people, but uh, that's a lot more people than uh, die in car accidents or mm. if you, you know, it, drug overdoses. So on other things that um, actually where attention is sustained. Um, and just more broadly, Nick, since we've got you here before I throw open to the um, audience, you how know, are you feeling I'm about, not, I'm you not, know? I'm not a clairvoyant. It'll be interesting. I don't know how it's going to work. I'll give it my best shot. Uh, it'll be... I mean, the government hasn't helped itself by breaking so many promises and when I have a GP who comes up to me at a function who happens to smoke cigars, he's a very proud cigar smoker, and tells me he's to the right of Genghis Khan, who is not going to vote for the Libs because the GP co-payment he thinks is a disaster, uh, you know you're in trouble, and I hope my Aunt Effie isn't listening to this. Um, Born in Cyprus, came out here 50 years ago, has probably voted for the coalition more often than not. I've never seen her angry in my life but they took away her senior supplement. And, you know, she's worked hard all her life. If you upset my Aunt Effie (laughs) and you're the government, you're in a whole lot of trouble. (laughs) Um, If you've got a question, just put your hand up and somebody will put a microphone in it. Here we are. Thanks. Um, 
I feel that there are some pretty strong parallels between like the uh, idea of tackling problem gambling, particularly in relation to poker machines, um, and the question of smoking and dealing with cigarette addiction. And um, I'm sure B.F. Skinner would agree with me that if you took away, say, the flashing lights and a lot of the audio cues and you know the little animation of Cleopatra winking at you on a poker machine, that they would lose a lot of their appeal. Do you think that there might be uh, any possibility for a plain packaging style <laughs> approach? It's a really boring reform? pokey. Yeah. Um, we already talked about it. Could just imagine. I mean, the industry, the Institute of Public Affairs, would be outraged. It takes away people's civil liberties to to lose their life savings in just a few few hours or a few days. Um, if you if dial down the machines, I'll give you an example of how hard the reform is. Uh, I pushed for legislative reform in the South Australian Parliament to change the uh, the, the coin receptacles because. Uh, when you, if you, when you have that odd payout, it would uh, jangle, you, you'd hear that noise. Um, a very simple suggestion to dull that noise and dull that reinforcement, if you're in the pokies room, would be to put felt in it. Um, it's actually quite expensive to have a tin, you know, to have a stainless steel coin receptacle. Uh, plastic would be much cheaper, but the researchers, you know, presumably part of the $132 million a year in R&D for these, some of these poker machine companies, uh, decided that we can't have anything that dulls the noise. Mm. So even putting felt in those machines would make them less addictive and slowing them down than the $1 bets and the smaller jackpots. But that's what the industry, and I understand James Packer, um, I think Andrew Wilkie said this publicly, if he hasn't, he has now in a sense, uh, James Packer is terrified of the $1 bets absolutely terrified because that will just change his business model. They won't make those big dollars from the people that lose a uh, very significant amount of cash very quickly. Mm. Jingle, jingle. We've heard the suggestion in recent days that the federal government may implement some kind of income management for people on welfare benefits to prevent them from spending money on various things like gambling, alcohol, etc. What are your thoughts on that impacting on pervasiveness of gambling? Look, income management, I can see the rationale. It might work in some cases, but it can also be quite problematic and stigmatising, stigmatise people. I think the solution is make the machines less addictive. It's a dangerous product. I try not to look at this as this, um, in terms of moral uh, and moralistic argument. It's a lousy product. It hurts people. I remember from the first Productivity Commission report back in 1999 that was commissioned by Peter Costello uh, that something like one in 20 people that ever actually touch a poker machine get hooked on it. Now, could you imagine a restaurant where one in 20, pa one in 20 uh, patrons of that restaurant got food poisoning? How, often that, how long would that restaurant be open for? It would be shut down. I mean, you have cars recalled because one in every 2,000 cars has a defective brake lining. We seem to have this, politicians have this moral blind spot in regulating this industry. Why? Because between them, state governments rake in $4 billion a year in poker machine taxes. So, you know, in answer to your question, I think that uh, we just need to tackle this quite, quite differently. It's a very cynical industry. I mean, that's the addiction, really, isn't it, I suppose, that governments have to these revenues? The number one jackpot junkies are state governments. Mm. Mm. I think I heard this morning on ABC Radio that the Northern Territory government has approved poker machines into um, outback Indigenous areas on the grounds that to not allow them would be discriminatory, would be racist. Is, is that true that that happened today? Because that seems I, like I, a terrible I tragedy I, to me. I, I, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I was stuck in a Senate committee hearing about the um, about carbon tax issues. But the Northern Territory government is the the, pla the Northern Territory is a place where they regulate online casinos. To get an online casino license, uh, not like online casinos, sport betting license, you get it out of the territory. And I've got to say, I think their regulatory regime is pretty slack, um, and I don't get where they're coming from. I know Adam Giles, when he was a, a backbencher, the, the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, decent bloke, but 
they seem to be just chasing this cash cow of of gambling. I, I just find it extraordinary. W- why would you create more harm in a community mm. uh, from a product that's already dangerous? Why would you do that, uh, particularly in communities that are already marginalised? I don't get it. Mm. And one of the um, things I was really struck by, both reading the Productivity Commission report, but also what Andrew Wilkie had advocated, what you had advocated, is, I mean, they say it's a no-pokies platform, but really they're very, very modest reforms, uh, depending on who you are, I suppose, uh, that, that, are being, that are being asked for. Is it, is it ever going to happen, do you think? Do you, I mean, if I had to imagine Australia and its relationship to gambling in 10, 20 years' time, I'm not seeing those $1 limits... I'm seeing, you know, but six-year-olds with, you know... But you can't give up. You ha- we're in a democracy. Mm. It's mm. never too late in democracy to change a bad law. And I sometimes I'm comforted by that quote of that old British Labor Party war horse, Tony Benn, who said something along the lines, it's the same each time with progress. First they say you're mad, uh, then dangerous, uh, and they ignore you, and then there's a pause, and then you can't find anyone who disagrees with you. So I just want to get to that pause stage and... and I just think you can't give up. Most people want something done. Neil Lawrence, who ran the Kevin 07 campaign, was behind the Stop the Loss Coalition, a brilliant communicator and an advertising man. And um, he hasn't given up. Um, he's working on a documentary on poker machines, I think. Mm. Um, and I think that th- there are too many people of goodwill and too many people being hurt for the issue to go away. Mm. Just following on from that last question and recognising that maybe reform is a while away, what do you think then, um, in the more medium term, what's the scope for engaging with the industry and how can the industry be incentivised to be more proactive about what they might call responsible gaming? Michaela, maybe do you want to have a have this a This really isn't my well? area, so no, Nick, but it's a, all a you. sense <laughs> of it, I suppose. I mean, obviously, Nick's in the thick of the, the policy and so on, but... Do you think they, you, from what you observed and the people that you spoke to, um, that there's a willingness? Um, not to speak to journalists. Um, I wasn't granted any interviews at all um, by anyone in the gaming industry. So I was met with nothing but repeated silence, um, which, again, you know, it would be different to have community engagement and rather than engaging with you know pesky journalists. But I can't really see it being a particularly back and forth dialogue anytime soon Look, I don't trust the industry I've seen it before I've seen it in, in, at a state level where they enter this grand compact with with uh, the community sector the welfare sector that's at the front line but they use that as a stalling tactic they don't tell a tall story they tell a stall story oh we need some more research we haven't had enough research we don't know how it works we don't know how addiction works and then before you know it three years have passed and more and more people have fallen by the wayside I think the thing to do is to just um, do think simple things like have a pokies phone in um, where people can ring and tell their stories. A lot of people come out of the woodwork that way. They can speak anonymously. Sometimes they can tell their stories publicly. You, you need to make it an issue. And if you know someone who's... Most people know someone who's been bitten by the pokies. Make politicians uncomfortable. If it's in your local seat, whether it's state or federal, Someone who's lost their life savings or a marriage is broken up or they've been uh, stolen from uh, f- because of gambling-related fraud, second biggest cause of embezzlement, uh, one of the biggest causes of embezzlement uh, in the country, um, gambling-related fraud, um, after uh, uh, you know, drug-related offences. The difference is that illicit drugs are that, illicit, but this is something that's been legalised but creates this new underclass, uh, this new class of criminals. I think you just get in politicians' faces, make them feel uncomfortable. Make, make just if you tell real raw stories of of how gambling has devastated someone, and look the politician in the eye and say, "What are you going to do about it?" and call for the one dollar bets. It's a pretty blunt and crude way of doing things, but I reckon it's as effective as anything else. I've given up on the industry. They make too much money from this business uh, to tackle addiction effectively. 
Things are being tackled, interestingly, at a really sort of community level too. You hear it every now and again in different ways, you know, communities mm. that want to be pokey free, yeah. other communities that, you know, don't want every pub in their town, uh, to, you know, balancing it, talking about it, coming to uh, agreement or not um, in, in, in different ways, it seems to be. I actually heard something on the ABC very vaguely this morning about a community, but it was very, very quick because I was busy. Um, but but uh, that that seems to also uh, be where a lot of these conversations really do take place. I think level. you just don't give up. Mm. While people are having their lives destroyed by these things mm. and online gambling is the next big challenge, um, you just don't give up. That's why I'll put up another piece of legislation, we'll debate it, we'll argue it, um, and uh, you just hope that you'll get to that tipping point. I think the next the issue is there'll be a federal election in maybe in two years, maybe less, depending on what uh, what happens in the Senate. Uh, make it an election issue, even if you ran a group of candidates in marginal seats around the country, that would focus the minds of the major parties. I mean, you know, I mean, Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott didn't give a rats about about poker machines, they were forced to think about it because Andrew Wilkie was in a balanced power situation. Let's be realistic about it. You really believe that? Absolutely couldn't care less. Well, I don't want to be... Well, the outcome was one of indifference. I mean, Tony Abbott was consistently hopeless on poker machines because <laughs> he just... He, he, he took a, an opposition... He took that approach of trying to knock down any, anything the government was doing... Uh, but at the end of the day, the outcome with the Gillard government was some incredibly watered-down reforms which have now been repealed anyway because Labor voted with the government to take away even these, these minimalist fig leaf reforms. So you've got to be cynical about it and you've got to hold them to account uh, at the ballot box. Well, uh, you have been remarkably consistent, uh, Nick Xenophon, I think, uh, uh, and uh, all the best with you know, your endeavours and, and uh, well, it's probably closer to a crusade, uh, really, but um, tough, tough work ahead. And uh, do you really think there might be an early election? By the way, I just let that slip through before, do you think? D just don't ask me, as one journalist said today, what the odds would be. I think that's <laughs> appropriate to be asking me on the odds. <laughs> like, so, go on, so someone can go on sports bet. Um, Possibly, I think that with, you know, Clive Palmer's Al Gore show recently, um, um, the carbon tax will probably be repealed. We'll probably have nothing in its place to abate carbon, which is not good from a policy point of view. Uh, but the go I don't think the government will go to an early election, or to a double dissolution election until about... Um, until early 2016, if they do that. But the trouble with the double dissolution election is you end up with more people like me which is yep. probably what the major parties don't want. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, look, thank you both so much for uh, sharing your expertise and uh, work with us tonight, Michaela McGuire. Now, the book, Last Bets, is for sale down at the end of the hall here and uh, it is a terrific read and it's a, it's a really interesting thing that you've done, Michaela, and I congratulate you taking two... Uh, you know, you, it, it's a manslaughter charge that happens to be in a casino, but you weave into it some really, really interesting uh, insights and work about gambling and Australian culture. So um, have a look at Michaela's book. And uh, Nick Xenophon, thank you for coming to Melbourne to talk to us. You'll have to write a book one day. No, that's... Uh no, it's polys and memoirs are a bit, you know... I might write a book of bad, jo politically incorrect jokes or something. Now, if you know. do, come and talk to us first. Okay. Uh, please thank our wonderful guests. <laughs>